Fellow Falcoholics, what is up? Welcome to episode 148 of the Falcoholic Live. I am your host, Kevin Knight, joined by some excellent guests and some more folks coming in as the night goes on. First of all, we have with us Evan Birchfield. He is at Evan Birchfield on Twitter, the director of guest personnel. Evan, how are you doing this evening? Evan? Oh no, did we actually lose him now? He he was having video problems before the show. Okay, yes, can you hear me, Evan? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. That's it's, funny. It was like totally fine. Yeah. Internet, it's awful. yeah. It was like totally um, fine. But I'm assuming show. you gave Yes, me an I asked how you were doing. So, yeah, yeah. Um, hey everyone. Um Yeah. Welcome, welcome. We also have joining us now uh Keenan Forney, former Falcons offensive lineman. He is at K Forney sixty five on Twitter. Keenan, we're just getting started with the intro, so you have you have impeccable timing. How are you doing tonight, man? Good. What's up, y'all? How y'all doing, man? Good, good. How was Hawaii, dude? Did you like it? The bomb dot com. Yeah, I think I was there smile, like still got on my face. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think I was I might have been Thanks. there like I literally of course yeah I, I went there for the first time I think like a week or two before you went so I was like oh wow that's kind of crazy uh but yeah I loved it it was it's really nice uh especially this time of year too so um yeah great place to visit thank you for coming on again it's been too long since we've had you so we had to get you back on uh especially to talk about the offensive line which of course is one of the biggest uh battles in training camps we're going to get to that in just a little bit guys also with us tonight we have noted hawks fan and matt ryan hater adnan ikich at say which way adnan i'm sure you're hyped buddy thanks for coming on before the hawks game how you doing Oh, I'm doing well, and I also think it's kind of rude that you guys are talking about Hawaii. Meanwhile, Dave is up there in the wilderness <laughs> somewhere. Well, I mean, Dave's only before. Dave's only slightly further north than I am most of the time, so you know. <laughs> He's somewhere in the woods right now. Somewhere, somewhere. Yeah. Speaking of Dave, we have Dave Show here as well at the Falcoholic and also at Words and Beer. Dave, how you doing? I'm great. It's uh, it's definitely not typical northern wilderness temperatures up here. So it I'm, is uh, it's like Hawaii with basically none of the benefits. So that's cool. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It was in Syracuse. It was well, it was 70 today, 61 yesterday, and 91 the day before. So you know, it was we've had a lot of weather lately, and uh, I don't think it's going to slow down anytime soon. But um, usually not that hot, but also usually not 60. So. We've had the, the full spectrum of weather um, ready for things to calm down here. I'm sure Dave is as well. So, <laughs> But yeah, guys, like I said, uh, we're going to talk about the offense. Obviously, with Keenan here, we're going to spend a lot of time on the offensive line battles at left guard and center, which are arguably the two biggest uh, battles on the offense, maybe the biggest on the roster in general. Um, but also, we're going to talk you know, about wide receiver about running back behind Mike Davis, uh, tight end, backup quarterback, which is suddenly interesting. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Obviously, not really much going on in terms of news. The Falcons have signed a couple more rookies like Richie Grant, some of the other guys. We're still waiting on the Kyle Pitts signing. Um, they kind of revitalized uh, and switched around some of the scouting staff as well. Um, but other than that, it's all quiet until training camp. So we're going to do our best to keep you guys, uh, engaged with some good content here in the meantime, but let's go ahead and get things started, uh, with some offensive line talk, because I think for most people, that is the position that is the least settled on the offense, you know, left guard and center, pretty much, uh, open competitions, so, Keenan, I'll, I'll go to you first on this. We'll start with center, where we've got Matt Hennessy and the rookie Drew Dahlman squaring off. Um, I know you're, like, a little bit familiar with Hennessy. I don't know if you've had a chance to really dig in on Drew Dahlman at all, but do you have any takes on who you're, you're kind of leaning in that battle? Obviously, Hennessy, you know, has the veteran experience of being there for a year. Drew Dahlman, uh, the choice of the new regime. Um, but, yeah, do you have any takeaways on that battle there? Not without having seen them play, but uh, of course, like you said, Matt Hennessy's, you know, got a year under his belt and that always helps a little bit more experience. And Drew Dahlman coming from Stanford, um, I know he played under, um, who was this? His dad is uh, actually Chris Dahlman, who was our office line coach here in Atlanta for a couple of years. So, you know, Dolly knows his stuff. You know, so I know if anything, his son has picked it up and he can always, you know, pick him up and, you know, 
tap into him and pick his brain a little bit. So um, who knows? I would say that probably the one that ends up being starter at center is probably going to end up playing left guard unless they go with the um, – who was the guy that they signed? Um, Josh Andrews mm-hmm. from the Jets. I think th- they might have him. And who else is Matt Gono as well? I just saw he had surgery, right? Yeah, yeah. So we, are, we don't know exactly how serious the surgery was. I know some speculated it was season-ending. Then there were you know other reports saying that it was not season-ending. So – um, we're not really sure there, but obviously, yes, if he's healthy, he's definitely someone who could factor in maybe Jalen Mayfield, if they're considering, you know, moving him to guard could be another option perhaps, but yeah, I agree with you. Those are the kind of the names that I was circling as well for that, uh, open job. But yeah, I mean, Josh Andrews at left guard, since you brought him up, um, the veteran in the room, obviously, uh, Matt Gono obvi- also got a shot at left guard, uh, briefly last year. Um, so that one is also pretty much wide open. It seems like Josh Andrews has been getting the early work at left guard in mini camp, but obviously we have a long way to go. Um, before we dive deeper on that, want to welcome in the birthday boy, Eric Robinson. He is at underscore Eric underscore Robinson. Eric, happy birthday. How you doing tonight? Thanks for uh, spending some of your precious birthday time with us. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good, man. Just happy to be on and talk a little Falcons football tonight. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, since you're the birthday boy, I'll let you weigh in on the center battle. Uh, it seems like maybe Hennessy is getting the first crack. We know they drafted Drew Dahlman. The new regime obviously likes him because they drafted him. What What's your thoughts on the battle right now? And who do you think ends up with the job? Uh, you know, obviously we don't know for sure. This is all speculation because look, guys, it's June. Okay. What do you expect? But uh, what are your thoughts on that center battle as it stands right now? You know, it's, it's kind of hard because the team not only showed interest in the draft, of course, and and bringing in a guy that could possibly be the starter. But remember, they they had interest in uh, Joe, uh, Joe Thune this offseason in free agency as well. So they were really serious about getting, at the very least, getting competition in for the, for the center position. I believe Matt Hennessy deserves the benefit of the doubt a little bit. And, you know as far as slotting him in as the starter at this point. Um, I, I think he deserves that at least. Um, and I also think he deserves a fair shot because the guy was thrusted into competition last year in what week 15. And, you know, he had roughly two or three games of center, you know, experience. And he so had to, he had, had to go up against Chris Jones and Indama Kinsu and Vita Bea in those three games. So it's like, it's, it's not fair where, you know, you're throwing him into the wolves and expecting him to be a pro bowl player. And, you know, the guy is still a baby at this point. Um, so I think right now he's probably the best option for him at center. Um, if I had to put my money on it, I think he wins the job. Um, but I do think, you know, Dahlman is going to get a fair shot. They're not drafting him in the fourth round just to be, you know, a backup. They're going to give him a real chance to win this position. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, you know, they obviously like Dahlman since the, the new regime drafted him. I think, you know, people maybe were a little bit too quick to write off Hennessy just because, you know, the new regime didn't necessarily draft him and he didn't, you know, he didn't stonewall Chris Jones and Vita Vea and those those guys, so therefore, Sorry. you know, we should just write him off, right? So. <laughs> I mean, I, I, in in terms of the measurements and athleticism and all that thing, all that, I don't really see much of a difference between him and Dalman. It's mm-hmm. not as if Dalman is, you know, is out outweighs him by twenty or thirty pounds. Like Dalman is barely two ninety. Um, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's not the most athletic center. Um, he's a little stiff in the hips, but where he excels at is, of course, his football IQ, his smarts. And in the run game, you know, he's able to get to the second level and show some surprising power despite being uh, sub 300 pounds. So I really don't see either one of these guys having like a clear advantage in that department in terms of, hey, this guy is more athletic or this guy is bigger or this guy is more powerful. Like they're pretty, pretty much the same to me. Yeah, this- yeah. They do. It does seem like, and this was an interesting thing that that I think a lot of people were were questioning going into the draft was uh, Arthur Smith had a type in Tennessee where they went for the road graders. They went for the big nasties, the big offensive line. And in Atlanta, they had been building to more of the zone-focused offensive line, smaller, agile, 
linemen that can get to the second level, that can get out on screen blocks, that can get out on move blocks, that can move really fast and take advantage of angles as opposed to just pure power. So the question was, is Arthur Smith going to totally revamp things, go for that bigger line, or is he going to go more of the zone focus to stick with what Atlanta has? And it seems like from his picks, I mean, Drew Dahlman definitely more of that zone focus lineman. Jalen Mayfield a little bit more versatile, but... um, he, he picked he picked the center that the previous regime would probably like more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. In Tennessee. Interestingly so enough, it, right? It was interesting to see that. Yeah. Um, all right, let's go to Adnan now for his take on the center battle. Adnan, where do you stand? Are you Team Hennessy, Team Dahlman, or Team Wait and See? Um, uh, Team Wait and See for now, I guess, since you gave me that option. What a, what a coward. I just knew you would take the coward thing. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even in training camp yet. <laughs> but it will be really interesting and it will be really nice to see that competition in training camp. Like that's going to be a battle for that center and for that left guard, uh, left guard spots, Jalen Mayfield, Drew Dahlman, like they have this golden opportunity to come in and to really showcase themselves and to have an opportunity to, you know, maybe even start from week one. However, I do see why the team would be so apprehensive to start so many young players on the interior of the offensive line. And that's why we've seen um, uh, Andrews get a lot of the burn at left guard, just because Matt Hennessy is about to be in his second year. You kind of want to avoid having Hennessy at center, Mayfield at left guard, and then you have Lindstrom and McGarry uh, also on the right side of the offensive line. That's that's four fifths of your offensive line, all having three years of less of experience with Jake Matthews as the old head in that. However, if Mayfield just like, you know, blows it out of the water, then I don't think you really have much of a choice. But I do think that it's their preference to have have sort of that a little bit of of the veteran hand within that offensive line, at least to start the season off. And that's that's how I think it'll play out. But it'll be super exciting to, to watch that training camp battle unfold. Yeah, I agree. That is definitely one of the more interesting ones. Dave, I will now let you weigh in. You'll get to go first on left guard because, you know, we buried you under this cavalcade of great co-hosts and guests this evening. But do you have an an opinion on the center battle as it stands right now? I do. um, I I would say everybody else probably said what I'm going to say better. So, you know, uh, that disclaimer before I talk here, but <laughs> I, I think it is going to be Hennessy. I think what threw me off with Hennessy was, you know, the team's reported interest. Um, and there was a lot of good reporting this off season on, um, you know, they were interested in a center, um, you know, in free agency and then heading into the draft when they did take Dolman. So you knew that they wanted to give Hennessy legitimate competition, which made me a little bit concerned about, you know, is he going to be able to get this job? Are they they trying to undercut him because they don't believe in him? But I think really it is just that ethos of having, you know, depth and competition everywhere you can. They really like Dolman, so they went and got him. Um, and if he doesn't end up starting, he's valuable depth. Um, but to me, hearing that Hennessy, you know, looks like he's grown after last year, um, that the experience did good for him, he's communicating better, he looks like the front runner. That, that's good enough for me to pencil him in there. I think ideally for the reasons that Adnan just mentioned, you know, you don't want to have, you know, two rookie starters next to each other unless you believe those guys are slam dunks to be great starters right off uh, the bat. And I think if Mayfield is going to take that left guard job, you want somebody even just a little bit more experience next to him. Um, and I still think there's a, a strong chance that Mayfield does take that, although the injury to Gano obviously kind of messes that up. So I'm, I'm going to say Hennessy for now. We'll see what happens, but um, I do consider him the favorite for the job. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, and that's not total. It's not terribly surprising given all the things that we talked about, you know, to open the show, which is Hennessy has the year of experience. Uh, it's a different offense, but just getting used to NFL speed is a big part of the equation, um, and he's got that. He's he's going to be ready to go. Um, I do feel a lot more comfortable with the depth having someone like Drew Dahlman, who is going to be a strong competitor for the job, even if he doesn't eventually win it. Having another strong guy behind your starter is a big deal. And before the drafting of Drew Dahlman, they didn't really have anyone there. So um, I'm excited to see who wins it. You know, I think if it was Dahlman, I think it would be a little bit surprising, but 
it's certainly nothing against Dom and more just that both of them are similarly drafted players with similar builds, similar talent. Just Hennessy has the benefit of having the year of experience and real NFL game action under his belt uh, to get acclimated. And that is very valuable, especially early on in your career. Um, so let's take a little bit of a trip over to left guard. It's not a very far trip, just one spot. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to answer some questions real quick. So from George Costanza, we got a $3 donation. George, once again, thank you so much for your help, for your support. We appreciate you. He says standard questions tonight. He wants to know what Adnan's drinking first. So Adnan, what do you got? Well, I'm actually about a dip right now because I'm yeah, I know, I know. That's I knew I had to get it in. Yeah. <laughs> so no, nothing at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Soon, perhaps, uh, but you know, I hope yeah. to be drinking Milwaukee Bucks tears tonight. <laughs> yes, we all hope for that. That's for sure. In terms of what everyone else is drinking, I've got some uh, 1911 uh, Honey Crisp uh, cider here. It's pretty good. It's a little sweet, you know, but it, it's good. Good stuff. Good flavor. Uh, he also says, "Let's go Hawks." Adnan, he wants to know what you thought of Ben Simmons. I love Ben Simmons. <laughs> I love that. I, mean, um, I, I may chant MVP for him next year when he comes to Atlanta. <laughs> MVP. <laughs> That's ben wild, Simmons is, uh, is, is a spirit animal for everybody who just didn't want to do the job that they're supposed to do <laughs> for one day. You know, like I, I appreciate that about him. Well, I'll hear no Ben Simmons slander right now. You, you know, that's. <laughs> yep. We have one more Hawks related uh, question from Jason Gaines uh, with the $2. Thanks, Jason. We appreciate you, man. Uh, he says, great to see Doc Rivers choke another playoff series, this time to the Hawks. Uh, fair. Also, I love Doc Rivers. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Yeah, we, we got to move no, forward, never. guys. New we'll regime now. That's Doc Rivers in the ball <laughs> bench lineups too. You know, couldn't have we have, We've got our pinatas though. We love them. We really do. <laughs> right. Hey, yeah. real quick, did anybody else see Josh Smith going off on Doc Rivers on World Star the other day? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Man, I would love to know the backstory of that. Yeah. 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 I, I don't understand that at all. Who shot at Mike Woodson? Hmm. Oh, man. It's definitely, it's definitely some locker room stuff that we don't yeah. know about. That's yeah, I, that. I went on his Instagram story that night, and it's one of those stories where, like, all all of the stories look like crumbs from how many there are. They're, like, this big. <laughs> yeah. I can't. I can't comment. You know, that's a little, that's a little outside, uh, you know, what I know about basketball. But uh, you guys – I'm sure you guys are fountains of knowledge about that stuff. So uh, yeah, go check it out. He says some real, yeah, he, he throws it out there. Some stuff, <laughs> right? yes, that is for sure. That's wild, man. Yeah. I mean, there's always stuff going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. So always. sometimes good, sometimes bad. So. And on that note, I'm going to dip for my cameo right now. Let's go Hawks. <laughs> yep. Go Hawks. Thanks all Hawks. for coming in. We appreciate you, man. Um, all right, guys. Uh, so let's move on to left guard. So a lot of names in the hat here. Unfortunately, it looks like maybe uh, Matt Gono's name has been taken out a bit prematurely. It seems likely that he will be back at some time this season because they were the team and other reporters were very quick to clarify that it's not season ending surgery for him. Um, but if he's not available for camp, that's going to make it hard for him to win the job, obviously. So that's unfortunate for Gono. We hope that he makes a quick recovery. Um, so right now it looks like Josh Andrews is currently manning the post, a uh, veteran played for the jets, played for a couple other teams, kind of bounced around a bit, but the fact that Fontenot and Smith went out and got him early in free agency is interesting. Um, because he was not a guy that had a ton of suitors, not a guy who's been a plus starter so far, but he was trapped on the jets. So, you know. There is something to be said about maybe a change of scenery from there could be beneficial. Uh, so, Dave, I'll let you get the first crack at left guard since we made you wait so long last time. Between Andrews, Jalen Mayfield, maybe Matt Gona when he gets back, uh, and anyone else who you want to throw into that competition, maybe it is Drew Dahlman or Hennessy or whoever loses that battle. Do you have a favorite right now uh, for the, the winner of the left guard battle? Yeah, I'm still thinking it's going to be Mayfield. And, you know, I know very well that, you know, you're asking this guy who is a rookie to start at guard after he spent his last season in college at Michigan um, at right tackle, I believe. 
So, you know, that is that is a bit of a change. He may not be ready, but I think the Falcons would like him to win that job. I think they would like him as guard. I think that's been the intention all along. And I think even if Gano, you know, is going to miss some significant time, I think they'd be more inclined rather than making Mayfield the swing tackle if they don't really believe that he's going to slot in there. You know, maybe you sign a Dennis Kelly. Maybe you bring John Wetzel back for the 15th time, cruelly. <laughs> Poor um, John Wetzel, man. Our, John Wetzel, I know. That that man, I would love to to hear his story sometime. I really yeah. would. Um, but, you know, I, I do tend to think they'll get somebody with a track record of playing swing tackle if they're not going to have Gano and that they will give Mayfield every opportunity to win that job over Andrews. I think Andrews is the kind of guy that – you'd feel good about starting for a couple of games if you needed to because of an injury or because somebody's faltering. I think ideally he would not be your full-time starter. I think that track record just isn't there. Um, and they clearly like, you know, Mayfield's disposition is talent and they think he can slot in at left guard. So he's my early pick for that. Um, I do think if he's given a fair chance to win it and he's ready, he'll, he'll take it. So mm -hmm. um, I've been saying that since he was drafted more or less, we'll see if that's right. Yep. But um, I think he's, I think he's the guy. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there. Um, I do like Mayfield a lot. He was a player that I, I did view as a second round talent. Um, and I know a lot of analysts, some analysts even had him as like a fringe first rounder. I, I wasn't quite there, but um because his ceiling is so high and he didn't have a ton of college reps, part of that was COVID, part of that was injury, uh, but just a really interesting prospect that I uh, I really do enjoy. I, wa I enjoyed watching his film. He's nasty, um, and he's just really talented. You can tell, you know, he needs some refinement. Just about every college offensive lineman needs refinement in the NFL, but um, it just depends on how quickly he's able to acclimate to guard. Uh, you know, the length isn't tremendous it's definitely enough to succeed a tackle i mean he was a good college tackle so um how keenan you know i'm sure you know way about more about this than we do how big of an issue is the length especially for college tackles coming into the nfl um you know nfl teams clearly have a threshold that they like they want you know 33 plus or 34 inch plus arms and all this how big of a deal is that for an offensive lineman um because it gets hyped up a lot in scouting circles but i'm interested to hear your opinion on that um, I think you have to have a decent arm length size. You know, you don't want to be no Tyrannosaurus Rex or <laughs> even like uh, I think Robert Gallery for the Oakland Raiders back in the day, their number, former number overall, he had some really short arms, but he was able to transition from left tackle and play well left guard. I don't think a lot of people talk about that. But as far as playing inside, it's really just getting used to that strength level because playing outside, you're out in space. You're waiting on people a little bit more. Inside is going to happen a lot faster, and you in there dealing with some bowling balls. So, you know, it's just a matter of how fast he can adjust to that. Because, I don't know, when I watched him play tackle, you know, some of the tapes I've seen, he has a really smooth kick set, you know. But you're not going to need that smooth-ass kick set playing <laughs> left guard. It's going to have to be short and fast, and you're going to have to, <laughs> you right. know, draw a line in the sand. So until I see it, you know, then I can better comment on it, you know? But as far as like everything else you guys have been talking about, his tools, his nastiness, how he stays on people at the end of the block, I love all that. I just need to see how's that going to translate to the Fletcher Coxes and the Aaron right. Donalds of the world. Right. Yeah, what do you think is the hardest thing for a tackle transitioning to guard to handle? Is it that quick, you know, because it's different. Like a tackle, like you said, your kick set in your pass sets, you know, you're going to be out on the perimeter doing stuff. When you're on the interior, you're getting guys in your face right off the snap every time. So what do you, what is the hardest thing you think in terms of that transition from tackle to guard for guys to learn? Getting used to the strength and how fast stuff happens. Yeah. Yeah, you know? that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, because the space is a lot more condensed when you're on the interior, so it just you don't have as much time. You have to be, you know, stronger, and it, it's it is a different ball game. I think a lot of fans just assume like, oh, you're a good tackle, that means you're a good guard. It's not the same thing. So not the same thing. Like, yeah. and you can you can look at some of the guys that have been coming out of college as tackles trying to go in and guard, like the kid for the Cowboys. He's having mm -hmm. a rough time. Uh, what's the name? Connor Williams, a left guard for mm -hmm. them. He yeah. was a tackle at UT, and he's having some trouble with that, with that strength on the inside, you know, because it's one thing at tackle, if you get bull rushed, you got a couple of seconds, the quarterback can see that and get rid of it. At guard, if you get bull rushed or center, you get bull rushed right now, 
you know, quarterback's mm-hmm. getting flushed out right now. Right. It's happening, you know, because yeah. the fastest way for those guys to get to the quarterback is inside. So yeah, it happens a lot faster and just the strength level. So, you know, if you can adjust to that, then, you know, you're going to be cooking with grease. But if you can't adjust to that, man, get back outside. <laughs> it's difficult. It, it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah buddy. It's the difference between playing an undersized edge rusher and then sliding inside and, and going up against a defender that adds another 50, 60 pounds of beef on them. And, you know, you know, you don't, you don't have to really deal with the athleticism as much on the interior, unless you get right. special guys like Aaron Donald or something like that. But like, like Keenan was saying, you're more likely going to get those bull rush type defenders at that point. Those guys that are those Fletcher Cox that are three thirty, and they're just going to, you know, getting your getting your, your your torso and then drive you back. So, I think right now from the athletic profile, I, I think Mayfield is the best option for him. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be honest with you though, I think Josh Andrews will probably start the season. Although I would like to see Mayfield win the job eventually, because again, he's three, he's close to three thirty, really athletic. He just wasn't able to put it all together at Michigan. You know, he had he had a few inconsistencies here and there. Um, but it's you know when you when you look at who he went up against while at Michigan, I mean he went up against you know Chase Young and Matur Gross Matos, and he went up against um, uh, the other uh, edge rusher from Penn State this year as well. Um, so he he had his fair share of athletic edge rushers in the Big Ten, um, but got to look at the start of the Falcons, you know, season. I mean, they're going up against Fletcher Cox in week one. And then they got what? Um, Vita Vea and <laughs> in week two, then you yep. come back and you get, you get um, Josh, um, Jonathan Allen yeah. and uh, Payne, Deron Payne from the Redskins in, or I'm sorry, from Washington. The football three. team, Eric. Yeah, the football team. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, to open up to season. I mean, that's that's starting the season. Leonard Williams is also in the beginning, in the top half of that season. As, yep. Uh, as well for the, on the and Dexter Lawrence, big fella. Dexter oh, yeah. Lawrence too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if Mayfield is ready, strap up, buddy, because it, yeah. it it ain't no easy start to the season against interior defensive linemen for the Falcons. No, yeah. I mean, yeah. Sometimes, like the best defense is just being bigger. You know, sometimes it's like, we ain't got great options here. So are you the biggest and the most athletic and you're relatively comparable in terms of like your, your like, you know, technique? Yeah. We'll just put you in there. You're 330. You know, you got a decent chance against these guys. You know, Sometimes that's all you got, you know, and you just all have right. to roll with it. But <laughs> right. I mean, Mayfield's obviously very talented. It's not just he the is. size. Quick yeah. question. Did he play strictly tackle at Michigan or did he have some guard time as well? Because I'd be a little bit more ease at ease if I heard he played some guard, and but he finished up at tackle at Michigan. All I've heard is that he was a tackle and then even seeing practice reps when he was in high school, he's taking tackle sets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean I if, I'm wrong, if somebody yeah, knows yeah. that, he, he tell me. He spurts at guard, but he was primarily at right tackle. And what the biggest issue for him was, it was kind of sort of with McGarry, the length. That is what got him in trouble at right tackle at times. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, he wasn't able to adjust to that accordingly. Be, you know, he, he really, he played and he leaned on his athleticism more than his technique most of his time at Michigan. That's the thing. So because of that lack of length, that's why, you know, a lot of people think he's better. He's a better fit at guard. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. But um, there were times in the run. I'll tell you, he's better in, in, in run blocking than he is in pass sets right now. Definitely. Yeah. That's, that's no question. The guy will get in your grill. I, I, I've been saying this often about him, Keenan, but I, I would not be surprised if he racks up a few unsportsmanlike conduct penalties this year. Like he's he he's probably going to be blocking after the whistle. I'd be fine with that. <laughs> right, right. You you'll be good with that. Yeah. yeah I but mean, I you need you, you need somebody to take it to the right, edge yeah, and a little yeah. bit faster. If, if he's yeah, a bully, yeah. like yeah, let him do his thing. You know, if he gets a, a, some penalties here and there, it's it's we can deal with it. Um, but I, I think he's going to be that type of guy. Like he's just going to be so irritable. And he's probably going to get a, a few penalties like that this year, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that just. Hey, that, and if he is suiting up week one, going against 
Who, we say we got the Eagles, Fletcher yeah, Cox. Yeah, yeah, so be yeah, Cox, he, yeah. You better go out there with that mentality against him. You better. Him. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, I mean. Well, look, it's better to hold to than to get a sack, always. Right, so man. if you got to hold, yeah, if you, you got to hold. Throw, if you got to throw sand in somebody's eyes, man, you, <laughs> you just do what you got to do. That's, you know, yeah. like that's. <laughs> That's what this yeah, is. Yeah, I, I actually, whatever it is. That's yeah, what, I mean, you know, I wasn't even thinking about the matchups early in the year, but that's that's a big deal for a rookie. Yeah. So yeah, they'll just have to be ready. That's yeah. all that there is to it. But you you know what the beautiful thing about that is is that nothing beats experience. You know, you can be yeah. in practice in shorts with your baseball cap on all day, but ain't nothing like getting out there. Sunday one o'clock and seeing what time it is with this guy across from you, you know, and having to figure out, you know, a few things. So, yeah, you know, nothing beats experience, you know. I mean, if so, man, throw him out there and let him let him learn, you know. Trial by fire is that what they call it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's. I mean, they did it. They did it for the the whole right half of their offensive line. I mean, <laughs> right. They, <did> <laughs> they, had, they had to learn. Yeah. Those guys were. I mean. They, and there was no sitting on the bench and soaking up, you know, information. Like, no, you guys got to get out there, man. But the yeah. thing is, with, with his attitude, his aggressiveness, this team needed that. Yeah. They haven't had that in a while. Like, they they just need those type of linemen that, you know, hey, they're going to get in your grill. And trust me, just knowing the game as much as I know, the defenders don't like that, man. They don't like offensive linemen that are just aggravating. I yeah. swear it throws it throws them off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you got an offensive lineman that is blocking you past the whistle and he's kind of leaning on you a little bit after he pancakes you to the ground, Keenan knows the defensive lineman don't like that, man. Mm-hmm. That's because now you're thinking about getting back at me instead of doing your job. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. The yeah. mental game, underrated aspect. Of, there's a of NFL. yeah. There's there's a reason I I think, and this is just from the fan perspective too. But guys like Harvey Dahl and and Justin Blaylock, people remember those guys fondly. You know, they had that attitude. Yeah. Um, it's part of the reason they were so good for so long. And I, I think that's definitely something that the Falcons need a little bit more of. Yeah, yeah, and honestly, like you know, you look back at guys like Chris Chester too. Like not necessarily someone who was viewed as like this elite guard but he had the requisite skills that Kyle Shanahan needed and that was enough like he was a fine right guard for this team for a few years um despite not being the biggest talent the biggest name they got him on a cheap deal I mean it was like if if you have a system that you trust and you know how to do it and you know the type of player you need to execute it you don't have to have the best guy in the league at that spot to make it work um, cause you're not going to be able to sign the five best offensive linemen in the league to play on your offensive line. There's just no way with the salary cap to make that happen. So you have to find a way to make it work with guys either through the draft that you're just hitting on these mid to late round picks, um, and, and t- turning those guys into quality starters for you, or just kind of hitting on the guys in free agency that the other teams sort of ignore, like Josh Andrews. Like I know we're all kind of low on Josh Andrews because of, his body of work, which let's be honest, it's not terribly impressive. It's not like it's a disaster. Um, He hasn't been a bad offensive lineman, but it hasn't been anything that would be like, oh, I want this guy to be my starter. So it really just depends um, on what you get out of these guys and how you utilize them. And that's the other part of this equation that we haven't really been able to see. And we won't be able to see until preseason at the earliest is how are they going to structure the offense and make this work? Knowing full well that they're going to have a a more than likely a brand new starter at center and left guard in terms of guys that might be either rookies or guys on their first or second start. I mean, no matter what, um, and especially at center. So how do you construct the offense to limit the amount of damage uh, and limit the amount of exposure that these guys are going to have to have? Like this was one of the biggest problems with Dirk Cutter was that he would put these guys out there on these deep passing attempts every single play at times. And it was, you know, that was not something that this line was necessarily equipped to handle. So 
I think Arthur Smith, knowing what we know about him and seeing the sort of offenses he's run in his past, is more likely to design a game plan that's not going to ask Jalen Mayfield or Matt Hennessy or whoever it may be in week one to block Fletcher Cox for three plus seconds on every single pass play. Because uh, that's a recipe for generating sacks. No offense to Hennessy or Mayfield, but Fletcher Cox is one of the best in the league. And, you know, you just need to figure out a way to, to get the ball out fast. Uh, especially early in the season until you know these guys are capable of blocking someone like Cox at a high level consistently. Um, so that's sort of the underrated aspect that we just don't know yet is, is Arthur Smith going to be more flexible with how he designs the offense as opposed to Dirk Cutter, who was very rigid in, in how he designed things, didn't have a lot of hot routes, didn't necessarily have a lot of quick hitting stuff. The offense, you know, the four vert scheme, not necessarily designed for that sort of stuff. Uh, so, other than screens, which, you know, we know how well those tended to go. So We don't know that yet, but let's let's agree for the sake of our sanity that it is gonna be better. Magically better. <laughs> we're not we're not even gonna talk about it not being because yeah, yeah. I can't do last year again. No, absolutely not. I refuse to to accept that the offense could be worse this year. And like they have they have to make up ground because of losing Julio. Like losing Julio is a big deal. But the addition of Arthur Smith, maybe those two things cancel out. If Arthur Smith is as good as you think, maybe it just offsets some of the loss of Julio and, you know, we, we improve in other areas, but we'll see. Um, and particularly in the red zone uh, was where this team really, really struggled last year. So even if these guys can just be good run blockers, like Jalen Mayfield, we know he's a mauler. Uh, Matt Hennessy was a great run blocker in college. Uh, Drew Dahlman, another very, very good run blocker in college. Hennessy, honestly, was a better pass protector, which is rare coming out. But um, yeah, and this is, this is I was just about to ask, Ray Moon, thanks for bringing this up again. Um, with the $2, thank you, brother. We appreciate you. Uh, yeah, Keenan, he wants to know, uh, Ray Moon, what do you think is easier for an offensive lineman to learn? Uh, run blocking or pass blocking? I think you may have answered this on a previous show, maybe like several months ago, but wh- where do you stand on that? Which one do you think is easier to pick up? Uh, it depends on the person. You know, if yeah. you're more athletic, you'll pick up on pass pro a little bit more um, and vice versa. If you're a little bit more aggressive and bigger and you like going forward more, run blocking will be easier. So it just depends on the person. Me personally, uh, in different stages of my career, High school, college, professional, um, different stages were a little bit harder than others, you know, because back in the 90s, coming out of Texas, we didn't have the spread offenses that a lot of kids have now and get their early exposure to pass protection. You know, we were wing T, veer, and all that other stuff, you know, three and four point stances coming off the ball. And so when I got to college, having to now learn to even up my stance a little bit and set back and head back and hands up and all that, that's a lot of different stuff, you know. So um, it was a little bit difficult, but I have to say that once I got to the professional level, you know, run blocking was a little bit harder. You know, it kind of switched a little bit, you know, because I was a tackle my last year in college and now I have to go inside and play guard. And the run patterns, the foot patterns, I mean, are a little bit different. So it just, you know, I know that's a long-winded answer, but... No, it's perfect. Honestly, people enjoy that. I mean, um, it's, I think a lot, I think honestly, the the part of most NFL offenses that fans know the least about is offensive line, because it is, most people watch the ball, right? So if you're not really studying and and digging on the offensive line, you, you miss out on these, all these little details. So we do appreciate you coming in with the knowledge on that i know you were an interesting case because i think at hawaii you said that um you know you mostly pass blocked and then you had to really adjust to the run heavy falcons offense when you got here which is kind of the opposite that you hear which a lot of you know a lot of times in that era it was more run heavy and switching to more pass blocking so that's just interesting to me um coming from your background uh, to, to more of a run heavy thing in today's NFL, everything's so pass focused. It's just a, an interesting difference there. But um, yeah, I mean, I know a lot of scouts would tell you that pass blocking is harder to learn, but I agree with Keenan. I think it's probably more depending on the player. Um, it probably also depends on the offense too. Um, you know, if you're running a lot of play action, you might have to, you know, do more run blocking that looks like pass blocking or more pass blocking that looks like run blocking. If you're running, 
like an option offense. You might have to be getting out and moving if you're running zone versus man, if you're doing combo blocks or traps or whatever, you know, it can get, run blocking can get very complicated. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate, you know, they look at pass blocking and you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's the hard stuff. But I mean, some of these run offenses are very complicated, have a lot of techniques, a lot of things they ask, particularly from those interior players. And that stuff's hard to learn too. It's not, it's not simple. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, you know, I was just sitting there thinking as you're talking, at Hawaii, you know, June's on, we're running the run and shoot offense. So just about 80% of the time when we're in O-line individuals, we're doing a lot of pass pro stuff, you know, using our hands, punching and balance and, you know, footwork and all that, you know. So it just depends, like you said, on what offense you're in and what are they re- what's really important to them. Because, you know, in the run and shoot, which is just like the spread, we – Played in a two-point stance the whole time. Two-point yeah. meaning, you know, both only our two feet are in the ground and we got our hands, we're carrying them right here, you know, a little bit below our sternum the whole time. Only time we were getting in the three-point stance is if it was goal line and, hey, <laughs> we're on the one and y'all know what we're going to do, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's, a lot, it's a lot more, um, you know, when it comes to that type of scheme, you know, you're, you're probably blocking for what? Two seconds, maybe three. So it's, it's a lot more timing based in that aspect compared to run blocking where you know you have to get a certain set and you you have to reach the second level in certain in certain certain plays because again it's 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 a lot more components that go into it you know um in certain those type of offenses you're you know offensive linemen are pretty much expecting the ball to be gone in two seconds or Mm -hmm. you know in in two and a half seconds or whatever so yeah it's it's a lot that goes into it and and a lot fans don't really understand that um and we, we talked about it on the show before. And I mean, I think it's pretty easy. <laughs> we talked about it on Twitter just... last week, right? Someone was like, uh, you know, why doesn't anyone respect Jake Matthews? And I was like, because the average fan doesn't understand offensive line play. <laughs> like, they see well, Matthews give up a sack and they're like, oh, yeah, he sucks. It's like, well, what about the like 35 other snaps where he didn't give up seen, a sack? Did I've you see those? Every, <laughs> I've seen every offensive lineman on the Falcons right now at some point on Twitter be transitioned to a different position. I've seen <laughs> I've seen Jake Matthews can play right guard. Oh, he, he should like, be a guard. You, yeah. You, it's not like left tackle is the most valuable position or anything in it. Right. <laughs> how do you how do you determine that Jake Matthews can slide in the right guard and play right guard? Like I don't all right. How do you it's, determine McGarry Some of it's probably play? like the Madden mentality, right? Where you can literally just change their position like on the Madden how do you thing. determine that McGarry can play <laughs> left tackle from day one. He's played right tackle his entire yes. Career. even in college you, yes you can't just simply go over there and say all right i got it let's do it yeah. it's also sure. just that like you make one mistake right you make one <laughs> big mistake and i always think of harry douglas yep Poor look douglas. at that guy having to having to carry that that passing offense that year that julio and roddy were hurt but it, it's that one play it's a stumble yep. right like you 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 make one big mistake like matthews you know had that holding call um and and it just the fans dog you forever right like you just you are known for that and that's i think that's more true now than it was you know 15 20 years ago because we weren't all talking about it constantly every day on social media the same way but it definitely feels like you make a mistake and there's just a certain number of fans that are never going to forgive you for it no matter what you do after yeah it's brutal yeah did you have something to add there too keenan sorry no, I was just sitting up thinking, man, social media will never let you live it down, no, man. It's, it's brutal. Hot today, and it's the throwback <laughs> next week. Right, yeah, someone's like, oh, do you remember this play from this random game? Here you go. Like, oh, yeah, thanks. Right. I didn't want to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yep. I, I, like, you can't even have a fight out here against <laughs> anybody without it being recorded. You know, back in the day, you get into a little fifth fight with somebody. It's just to the memory of your friends and people around it. Now, you get into a fight. <laughs> Man, you better hope you win and somebody don't sleep you. Cause right. Yeah. Hear, You're going to have to live that down. Yeah. I hear about yeah. 28 to 3 during baseball season. I'm like, man, we're not even watching football right now. Like, why, are we, why are we talking about that? Like, it's just, it, it's, I love social media, but then I hate it. Yeah. Like, oh, it's crazy. God, it's crazy. Like, going back and doing some of these, these articles on, like, the Forgotten Falcon series that I'm doing, like, you got to go back into like the newspaper archives just to get information. You learn all sorts of interesting things, but like nowadays, like every mistake, every fight, like you said, Keenan would be blown up in a way that it just wasn't back then. So it is playing in this environment just magnifies everything you do. 
Yeah, it does. It's a different era, man. And with the everyone has cell phones, everyone's taking. Be careful out there on those internet streets, folks. Like you never know who's filming or who's recording or who's tweeting. So you know, be careful before you hit send. So <laughs> you know, I think there's some people on Twitter today that maybe needed to hear that message. So you're getting this a little bit late, but you know, maybe think a little bit harder before you hit send. Certain sports media people. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, offensive line, very interesting. We know like very little about the battle or how people look. We haven't really had a chance to see them ourselves. So we can't really say anything definitive, but I think this is about as close as we're going to get before camp. Uh, so there you have it, folks, on the offensive line. Battles, before we move on to some of the other positions on offense that are interesting, let's read off some donations. First of all, from George Costanza, $3. Again, George, thank you so much, man. We appreciate you. He says... Smith is not going, Arthur Smith is not going to make Matt Ryan take seven step drops every play in the face of pressure. Tom Brady has been great because the offense is designed to get the ball out, and that helps take away the pass rush's legs. I think Pitts is going to flourish with those five yard curls and slant routes. This offense is going to shock you. I mean, I hope so, George. Your, your optimism is infectious. You know, I think you willed Pitts into existence. So if you can will this team to like a 14 and three season or whatever you said, you know, I'm all for it, buddy. So. You know, thank you for the, for the positivity. Uh, we also have another three dollars from George, uh, saying happy birthday to Eric. Uh, Eric, you might be old, but you look so young. It must be all that water. Drink a soda tonight for me. <laughs> LOL. Thirty three is old. No, I don't think he actually knows how old you are. But he's just saying, you know, because it's a birthday. So. Man, that kind of hurts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, I'm about to be 37, so that really hurts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm only 28. Oh man, oh, I'm the little baby. Oh, I thought I was on, older dude. than Evan, and Evan has a baby face. You know, Evan left, so we can talk about him. But uh, <laughs> no, so I always just assumed Evan was like this young guy, and he's like, no, I'm like 30. I was like, oh, what? Oh, I feel weird now. So yeah, I'm I'm the Falcoholics baby still. And maybe Adnan's younger than me. I don't know. But Adnan is good. younger, and he does that all the time. He's like, I was five years old when that happened. When yeah, I'm talking he about likes something. to remind us. Yeah, <laughs> that 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 always hurts. That yeah, hurts every time. It's brutal, man. It's brutal. All right, so hey, question, quick yeah, question: yeah. Is that for is that George's real name, or is he <laughs> playing off the Seinfeld character? No, he's playing off the Seinfeld character. Okay, I think right. I think I did know. learn his name at one point, but. Uh, I think I'm, I'm sure he asked me not to share it uh, because, but he does love Seinfeld. So that's why he goes by George Costanza. So. <laughs> Shout out to Seinfeld, man. I yeah. enjoyed this Seinfeld episode late at night when ain't nothing else on, you know, Seinfeld. Shout yeah. out to Seinfeld. Yeah. Yeah. Harry David. No, because of George, I'm start. I'm going to start watching it. My wife says it's great. Um, so we're going to start watching it soon once we finish the, the, the show we're currently on. But yeah, I know it's a beloved show. I mean, I've seen like episodes here and there, but I haven't sat down and watched the whole show. So uh, I'm going to have to check that out. Uh, so George, you know, you inspired me uh, with your love for George Costanza to, to check it out. So thank you for that. Um, so guys, let's move on to, let's see. We'll start with wide receiver because I think that one's maybe the second most interesting, at least in my opinion. Um, obviously, the loss of Julio is big. We're not going to linger on that. We've talked about the trade to death, but it's Calvin Ridley at wide receiver one, and then who knows at wide receiver two. Obviously, Russell Gage, the second most talented wide receiver, probably the guy that's going to get the second most targets, but he plays in the slot. How often is... Arthur Smith going to use a slot receiver. He didn't really incorporate that into the offense much in Tennessee. Could be different here. We don't know. Um, we also have guys like Alameda Zacchaeus who impressed in limited action. We have guys like Frank Darby who was just drafted. The team brought in Tajay Sharp when the Julio trade was about to go down. So it seems like they clearly like him. He has experience with Arthur Smith. Eric, you look like you're chomping at the bit. So I'm going to go to you here. Uh, <laughs> who do you so who do you think is going to be the the other outside because Russell Gage is probably going to be the nominal wide receiver too but we don't know if he's going to play outside or if they're going to work him in in the slot or what so who do you think is going to be the outside receiver opposite Calvin Ridley is it Russell Gage or is it one of these other guys what do you think (laughs) I need a definitive prediction that you can never go back on despite going to training camp and seeing these guys in action. I need 100% certainty about who the other outside receiver will be right now. Go. If they don't make, <laughs> if they don't sign anyone else, 
at the position, which is a possibility. I I think I think Frank Darby wins that spot. Yeah. Um and I know depth chart wise, you know, Russell Gage is gonna be the wide receiver too. And, you know, I think people need to start using that term a lot loosely because there's a lot <laughs> that goes into determining wide receiver one and wide receiver two and all that type of stuff. But that's a different conversation. Um, I think he's better suited for the slot. Um, but I think Frank Darby will eventually win it based on his route running and his ability to, in my opinion, beat, beat the press a lot more or a lot better than Russell Gage at this point. Um, and I, he played a lot of the Z receiver spot at Arizona State, and he thrived in it. And during his time, he played opposite of Brendan Ayuk. He played opposite of, I think he was there. Yeah, he was there for a year playing opposite Nikhil Harry as well. So he has experience. Yeah. Um in that particular role, in that particular spot on the wide receiver depth chart. So I think it's going to be him um, eventually winning it. Um, but I think, you know, this is going to be, I don't want anybody to think that, you know, any receiver is going to be slotted for a certain, like they're all going to be moved around. I mm-hmm. mean, this this offense is going to ask for, hell, it's going to ask for Kyle Pitts to play X receiver at times. Right. It's going to ask Hayden Hurst to play it at times, depending on matchups. Um, and depending on game scenario. So in terms of just the sake of the conversation, the sake of the topic, I think Frank Darby eventually wins it. Yeah, the team does seem to be very high on Frank Darby. They've He's been mentioned like constantly. Um, like he would have been a day two pick if he didn't get hurt last year. Yeah, I would love to have him on here um, because apparently he's the funniest guy on the team per uh, JV and Hawkins. So... Uh, you know, Evan, we're going to try to get him to work his magic, see if we can get Frank Darby on here, because I feel like he'd be a blast to talk to. But he's, he can, he's one of the best teammates you can have just because of, because of the energy, the energy he brings in practice, on game days, in meetings, in interviews, the guy is just a great source of energy. And, and, um, sometimes, again, sometimes you need that, especially, you know, on, on, when you're trying to bring, usher in a new culture. Um, yeah, he's, he's going to be that guy. I, I, I like, I like him and his, uh, his potential on this team. Yeah. I like it too. Honestly. I mean, for me, it's like, I think, I think a lot of people are maybe looking at him and it's like, Oh, he's a sixth round pick. You know, he's going to be, you know, a role player at best, you know, but yeah. we talked about it before the draft. Like you could get a wide receiver three, like on day three easily in this in this draft class because the wide receiver depth was so ridiculous. I mean, this is one of the deepest classes we've ever seen. You know, right. my guy, Sim- Simi Fajoko, went like uh, not very far before the Falcons picked. And, you know, I was thinking he would be a fifth round guy. You know, this is this was a stacked class. Um, you know, Frank Darby wasn't necessarily someone I was like super high on, but um, that just goes to show that there's like a, there were a million guys in this class. I only watched like 25 wide receivers and I barely scratched the surface. So, um I do like Darby. I think he has a, a good shot at that job. Um, I think, you know, regardless of who it ends up being, I think we can kind of tell that the Falcons like this wide receiver core a lot because who they, they like who they have, whether that's Zacchaeus or Darby that they drafted, Russell Gage, Calvin Ridley. Like, they've known allegedly since taking the jobs in January that Julio Jones was going to leave at least March they've known Julio Jones was was going to ask for a trade and wanted to be released so they've known since free agency started since before the draft that they needed to find a way to to find another receiver opposite Ridley and they didn't do much like they drafted Frank Darby in the sixth round and we've you can take it further than that I mean yeah you know, Arthur Smith knew about it before he even got the job. Yes. So, like, exactly. Like, they knew Julio wasn't going to be here. It's not like that was a surprise to them. So, the fact that they didn't really do much at wide receiver probably tells us that they like the options they had. They did make a few additions that were key, I think. Like, you know, we talked about Frank Darby. Eric really likes Frank Darby. I'm sure the team does, too. Don't get too caught up in the fact that he's a six-round pick. Doesn't mean that they don't like him. Uh but they also, you know, signed Tajay Sharp off waivers as soon as he was cut from the uh, 
the Chiefs. Um, and Arthur Smith and Tajay Sharp have a history. Sharp had his best year under Arthur Smith. I think it was 2019, where Sharp, I think, had four touchdowns and like over 300 yards, which is, you know, wide receiver four production. Um, and Sharp is has great size, too. So, like, it just depends. Like, I, I guess to me, the favorite's probably Zacchaeus, in my opinion. But Frank Darby and Zacchaeus, like, they're kind of different players. So they could both get reps. Like, Zacchaeus, more of the speed demon, more of the yards after catch guy. Darby's more of the contested catch guy, the physical, savvy route runner type. Whereas Zacchaeus is more of the, you know, dynamic presence. I think they're both, both going to have a role. But it just depends on what Arthur Smith wants. You know, does he want a guy streaking downfield, taking the top off the defense in Zacchaeus? Or does he want more of a... Uh, reliable, intermediate to short yardage guy like Darby. We also mentioned Tajay Sharp, who could be a threat in sort of possession situations in sort of red zone because he's 6'4". Um, so I guess to me, I'm leaning Zacchaeus, but I think any of those three guys, whether it's Darby, whether it's Zacchaeus, or Tajay Sharp with his size and experience with Smith, I think all three of those guys are going to get reps. It's just we don't know which one is going to be on top. Dave, do you have a takeaway there, or did you have something else to add, real quick, Eric? Or oh, I was just, I was going to say that I have a in, in terms of a ceiling, or or you know, I guess a comp because you know fans like that. I I um I said Michael Gallup was a good comp. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Um, I see that. The, you know, the body type, the you know, not necessarily the burner, but he has more of that build up speed, able to win and uh, able to win deep and get contested catches despite not being, you know, 6'4", 230 with long arms and stuff like that. Like, I, I think that's a really good comp for him, for Frank. Yeah. Going forward. Yeah. No, I, I like that comp too. Dave, I'll let you get a, a word in here. Do you have a preference at the other outside wide receiver spot? Who are you sort of eyeing at this point to be the starter opposite Ridley? Or do you think it really will be more of a committee approach? Yeah, I, I think after, you know, hearing Eric talk about Darby, it, it's so hard not to get excited about Darby. He's a guy who's easy to root for. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to have a prominent role in this offense. I still expect the de facto number two to be Gage. I think I know he's played primarily in the slot, but I think he is capable of playing outside. I think he was a little bit pigeonholed under Dirk Cutter in a way that I don't think he will be with Arthur Smith. I'm expecting him to be the number two receiver when the Falcons are only using two. And I expect hopefully Darby to get outside um, with Gage in the slot when they're using three. But my, my early expectation is just that Gage being as good as he is, um, showing that he can produce as he did last year, will end up um, playing outside more than he has in the past. And I think Arthur Smith has foreshadowed that a little bit. So that's my expectation for now. I think that uh, a year from now we might be talking about Darby being, you know, full-time starter opposite right, Ridley. Right. I just not quite sure we're going to get there this year, but um, I want to believe, and, and certainly Eric uh, makes a persuasive case for Darby. So, does, um, in, in the spirit of a birthday wish, I'm, I'm hoping for Darby too, <laughs> even if I think it'll be Gage. Yeah, no, that's fair. No, I, I, I love Darby. Like. It would be really great if Darby turned into a wide receiver two for this team, being a sixth round pick. Because if you know, if nobody steps up and the wide receiver group is a little bit of an issue, you know, they're probably spending a high pick next year. Maybe that pick they got from Julio Jones trade on another wide receiver, and they're probably still adding a wide receiver regardless next year. I think it's smart to add wide receivers and running backs if you can every single draft just to kind of take shots on day three. But um yeah, it'll be very interesting to see who wins the job and if Frank Darby can be that kind of late round steal. But yeah, Keenan, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that wide receiver group. I don't know if you prefer more of the speedy guy opposite Ridley or maybe more of the, the Frank Darby kind of savvy or the size of someone like Tajay Sharp. I like the speedy guys. I'm yeah. sorry. That's the, that's the girl I want to take to the prom. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's <laughs> fair. Yeah, I mean, I like Zacchaeus too. Like, I mean, I think... Ridley has the speed, certainly, but I think having, and and maybe it's not every play, but, you know, if you can have Zacchaeus streaking downfield, especially if you've got cover one, you know, you can pull that safety down. That can open up a lot for you on those intermediate routes. You know, if that safety has to cover the deep route, um, you know, that is a threat 
uh, we know Arthur Smith from his time at Tennessee, assuming he runs a similar offense, is going to be hitting those intermediate routes, especially when he's able to get stuff cleared out uh, with the safety. So I, I, I like that take. I'm a big fan of the speed as well. Yeah, because all I can think about is them using Kyle Pitts as number three wide receiver in some mm-hmm. kind of way, line him up inside and get him on them smaller dudes yeah. that, you know, smaller DBs that came, they can't mess with him physically and then put him on those guys that like the linebackers who can't run with him, obviously. You know, yeah. I think he's uh I think he'll be great off at that. Yeah, I agree. And that's probably like he's technically a tight end, but maybe he should be talked about more as like bolstering the yeah. receiver group because of how good of a receiver he is. Like they will probably use him outside from time to time, just lined up in that sort of Z receiver, X receiver sort of role. Um so, you know, maybe it is worth considering that he is going to help the wide receiver core maybe more than let on, even though he's technically a, t- a tight end. But, you know, they've got Hayden Hurst and Kyle Pitts, so they might have Hurst lined up in line and then have Pitts, Pitts flexed out wide, you know, so he kind of functions like a wide receiver or vice versa. So mm-hmm. Still got Hayden Hurst. We there still do. Go. Yeah. Two tight end ones for most, you know, obviously Kyle Pitts be the tight end one on probably all but like three or four teams, but Hayden Hurst probably be the tight end one on maybe a third of NFL teams right now also. So uh, the Falcons have loaded up on tight ends, and I I think we're going to see this tight end room be a huge uh, boon to this offense that it hasn't been since, what, Gonzalez maybe? The last time we had a tight end room this impactful, I think, so... Um, we'll see. We'll see. And no, you know, shout out to Jacob Tammy too. Uh, he, he held it down that year, man. Uh, he was, he was crushing it when he had to be the offense opposite Julio Jones in 2015 because they didn't have a number two. Uh, so shout out to Jacob Tammy on that one. But, uh, all right. So let's talk a little bit. We won't get to all positions tonight because we've got to leave some stuff for other episodes, but let's talk also a little bit about backup quarterback. Cause I think that one's a little bit interesting before we wrap up tonight. Um, I know you, I know folks are like trying to watch and also watch the Hawks game. We don't, we don't feel offended. I know a lot of people are going to watch the show tomorrow. Not a big deal. Thank you guys for tuning in anyway. But um, all of a sudden, you know, the backup competition is interesting. They signed AJ McCarron right after the draft, you know, conspicuously didn't get a uh, quarterback in the first round. So that was interesting. And then signed as an undrafted free agent, Felipe Franks, uh, one of the, in my opinion, most interesting quarterbacks in the draft um not necessarily one of the most sought after ones but in terms of late round slash undrafted guys you could go after i think he is maybe the most interesting undrafted quarterback in the whole class i know thor nystrom the scout we had on from nbc sports edge uh was a huge fan of the signing and he was like look very few undrafted quarterbacks are going to make an impact in the NFL. So it's all about getting the ones that maybe have a slight chance to actually do it. And maybe Franks has a 5% chance of actually turning into an NFL starter where someone like Ian Book, drafted by the Saints, maybe doesn't have that high of a chance <laughs> despite being drafted. So, uh, Dave, I'll go to you first on this one. What do you think about that backup competition? Is there any scenario where Franks is the quarterback too? Or do you think he's fighting for that quarterback three roster spot if he's impressive enough or ticketed to the practice squad in 2021. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, um, you know, I think we're kind of used to the Falcons prizing, you know, stability and, you know, just like a baseline level of competence. I always think back to John Parker Wilson um, as the backup and like, you knew what he did well um, and it wasn't what Felipe Franks does well, right? He wasn't great at moving. He didn't have a cannon arm, that kind of stuff. So I actually think he has a decent shot of getting that backup job. I think McCarron doesn't have a lot of guaranteed money on that contract. It's a one-year deal to begin with. He's not a guy who has, you know, produced when he has been in games. He's more of like, hey, hey, you know, we need a a baseline level of um, experience and competence here. And, And maybe that's the direction the Falcons go in, but I think if Franks is impressive this summer, he's got a real shot at it because I, I think very much that, that Arthur Smith would like to have somebody who is legitimately interesting as the backup to use on, you know, just a handful of plays per season, um, take advantage of that athleticism and that arm. And if nothing else, if Matt Ryan goes down, you can try something new and interesting too. So you know, I, I made my fair share of jokes because I knew there weren't a lot of Felipe Franks fans um, here 
on Falcoholic mm-hmm. live shows in the past leading up to the draft right. about them drafting him. Um, and they didn't draft him, but clearly they do like, you know, some of the physical traits. And a guy like that is tough to pass up because when you're a really good coaching staff and you believe in yourself, and I think this coaching staff is both, I hope they're good. I know they believe in themselves. You know, a project like Frank's is somebody that you look at and say, hey, I can fix this guy. I can make this guy the best version of himself. And I think if he shows any signs of that this summer, yeah, he's got a real chance of taking that number two spot. Yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, Thor mentioned it as like, look, this is the big brain play for NFL teams is to have this, you know, competition and be like, oh, well, he won the backup job. And it's like, look, either he's going to, if Matt Ryan gets hurt, this team's probably not competitive no matter what. So that's one aspect to consider. But if Franks has to come in, you know, we're going to find out real quick. Like, is does is there something to work with here? And if there's not, you know, we need to go in a different direction. And if there is, okay, now we got something. But one way or the other, if he's good, maybe we're still competitive. And if he's not good, then we're getting a better draft pick. And it's not really tanking <laughs> because you're putting your guy out there. You're not trying to lose games, but you're also not just trying to tread water with a guy like A.J. McCarron, who is a solid backup quarterback, but you're not... Like your hope, the best case scenario with AJ McCarron is that he doesn't screw up for a couple of games. But if Matt Ryan's out for the season and God forbid that ever happens, but like, you're not really competing. Like, let's be honest. Like maybe with Franks, you have a chance to kind of reshape the offense a little bit, change to more of a, you know, run and pass sort of thing where he's running options and doing RPOs and kind of, you're just kind of trying to make something completely different in terms of what the quarterback does, you could maybe steal a couple games from teams by running a different offense where they don't have tape on it. And you've got, you know, Franks playing at a semi-competent level with the sort of weapons the Falcons have. Maybe you could win a couple games that way. But um, so, so that is an underrated aspect of it. It's like, look, either it works and you look like a genius or it doesn't work and you get a better draft pick and you look like a genius. So, you know... <laughs> <laughs> either way you win um and with aj mccarron it's like what are you really doing other than treading water and that's the worst possible thing you can do in the nfl is tread water so uh you know we'll see what how it shakes out there but eric do you have a take on the uh the quarterback battle here i wasn't a felipe franks fan and when he was at florida i wasn't much of a fan when he was in arkansas he had an okay season. I thought he had like improved, but um, yeah. we'll we'll see. We'll see. I mean, things can definitely change. You know, you put him in an environment where he's learning from a veteran quarterback that's a former league MVP, um, and you you know you put um, a, a solid, really solid offensive of play caller around him like Arthur Smith. You know, he may be able to to, you know, work out the kinks a little bit in this game. You know, when it comes to certain aspects of his game, there's certain things that he, there's certain pluses that he does have. You know, he has arm strength. That's for sure. Um, He's super athletic. He was like, what, a 95 percentile athlete at quarterback too? So He has the NFL frame and he's athletic. It's just, it's the little things that come to being a quarterback that gets gets him in trouble. The decision making, the ball placement, the accuracy is not there. Those are the little things that he Mm -hmm. needs to work out at the next level. And again, you're sitting behind a former league MVP. I expect him to learn a thing or two when it comes to being a quarterback in the league. So we'll see. I'll give him a fair shot and I'll give him time to develop. Um, But I, I will say this, like, you know, just the raw skills that he has, along with the fact that he's he's sitting behind, you know, a future Hall of Famer and Matt Ryan, I do expect him to, you know, develop. Yeah. Given time. So yeah. we'll see. This is exactly the type of guy I think we all wish the Falcons had gone after previously. Like, you know you have Ryan. You know he's an Iron Man. He doesn't miss a lot of games. I mean, he does occasionally miss a game or two. But look, Matt Ryan is a tremendous talent. And, like, God bless him, he takes so many hits, and he's just tough. Um, so you, you can kind of get away with these having a more developmental quarterback, and the Falcons just seemed terrified of doing that. Um, you know, they would always have guys like Matt Schaub, who, look, look to be fair, every time Matt Schaub played, he, he lit it up, especially his, like, couple, last couple of years in Atlanta. So, like, no offense whatsoever to Matt Schaub, but 
they just seemed afraid to kind of have a more developmental guy behind Ryan to actually learn and develop. And like early on in the career, it makes sense because it's like, look, if we develop someone, he's probably just going to leave after his rookie contracts up if he's really that good. But now is the type of time where you're looking at Ryan's career, maybe being, you know, on its down, on its down slope in terms of he might, you know, three to five years probably is the timeline for when he's thinking about retirement. Um, so getting a guy in here to develop over time makes a lot of sense. Franks is the type of talent, the type of raw player with tremendous upside that I think makes a lot of sense as someone to develop behind Ryan. But I'm curious, Keenan, from a veteran standpoint, what where do you kind of lean on that? Do you like the more established veteran backup that maybe hasn't necessarily lit it up, but you know he's got NFL reps, you know he's got the experience to run an offense, or do you maybe more interested in a guy like Franks who has the athleticism to run maybe a, a simplified but different offense has that upside. I'm curious as from a veteran standpoint, where do you kind of land on, on what sort of backup you might prefer? I have to see both of them at practice. I have yeah. to see how, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I, me, I used to pay attention to everything. I paid attention to body language. I pay attention to how fast they get the call from the coach and how fast they can spit it back out. Are they back there? fumbling it around, right. you know, and when they come up to us, are they giving it to us like they got confidence, you know, and also too how they play. So I got to see it from, I got to see it from all ends. Yeah. Practice absolutely. game. You know what I mean? Just how they yeah. operate. Cause you know, some young guys can be in there. They might not have a whole lot of experience or whatever, but you know, they, uh, you know, they got you, they got you at least believing that they can do the job and, mm -hmm. you know, they're not going to bitch up out there. <laughs> yeah. Underrated aspects of being quarterback, right? Like you have to be able to command a, like a line of look, like, I mean, it would be intimidating for me to walk out on that field, having to come in and be like, okay, Keenan Forney, Alex Mack, uh, I need you guys to do this for me. You know, like it, it, it can be intimidating. So, you know, it, it is, I think a lot of people maybe do underrate the personality and the leadership ability as a, as a factor in that sort of thing. Man, you you could be scared as hell. If you are scared as hell, do not show it. Like at least come up there and what what's the old term? Skull Duggery, make us feel like you like you <laughs> fake got it till it. you, you make it, I mean? right? Yeah. Yeah, fake it till you make it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's un that's an underrated. But if you come, but thing. If, you come up, if you come into that huddle acting all scary and can't hardly get the play out, I'm gonna be like, oh man. Oh hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can't do this. It's oh well, that's over. Yeah. Fumbling no. over the play and uh, we need 32, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're going to be in there looking at him like, oh, got the armband <laughs> on, like, okay, guys, yeah. we need a... <laughs> you got to waste a time out. Oh. Yep. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, that's the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And we get, like, that's the thing, like, us on the outside looking in, we don't get any of that information. So that, I think that's a, a great perspective to have is that it is... That makes more of a difference, I think, uh, than people realize is like, how well do you command the huddle? How how quickly can you acclimate to to running an NFL offense and being that sort of presence in the huddle? Because you don't have to be the most talented guy as long as you're able to run it. Can you do it? Can you command the offense and, and actually take charge? Because everyone's going to make mistakes. Like, I don't care how much experience you have. You're going to make mistakes. It depends on how you bounce back. Depends on how quickly you can get the calls out. Uh, and, and can you make plays, too? You know, can you overcome? So, Man, it's, it's one point. person off in that huddle. You know, the quarterback, he's responsible for pretty much knowing what everybody is supposed to do. You know, there will be some guys in that offense that will – kind of know what everybody's supposed to do, but the off, the quarterback's supposed to know what everybody's supposed to be doing, and he's supposed to get in that huddle and sort of give you some sort of sense of relief, like, hey, I got this. Yeah. Let's go. We got yeah. this. You know? That was kind of mm -hmm. one of the first things I looked for when Matt Ryan first got into the huddle in OTAs when he first got drafted. I was like, from the very first one, all right, in my head, all right, let's see how he get in here. Mm -hmm. And when he got in there, I was like, okay, yeah, he'll be all right. Yeah. And he kind of yeah. carried that up until this point. Yeah. we can all see. Yeah. And I mean, I think, honestly, the fact that they haven't added any other quarterbacks since OTAs and minicamp probably bodes well for Franks. Um, because if he, like you were saying, if he's timid in the huddle, if he's not 
doing what he needs to do, they're probably bringing in more competition at this point, I would think. So the fact that they haven't, it's it's just Ryan, McCarron, and, and Franks right now. So, like, it, it's there's not really anybody else there. Like, they, they must feel at least some level of confidence that either one of McCarron or Franks is going to be their backup. So um, that is interesting, and I appreciate you bringing that sort of mental aspect into it and that sort of leadership because... You know, it's for us who are so far removed, like until we at least get to training camp to maybe hear an echo of a call or something like it, we just don't get that aspect of it. So I appreciate that, that insider veteran perspective on, on, uh, the, the finer aspects of being a quarterback, not just, can you chuck it 50 yards downfield? It's like, can you tell us what play we need to get into before you chuck it 50 yards downfield to make sure there's actually a receiver 50 yards downfield when the ball is thrown. So, yeah. <laughs> Got to act like it's not too big for you. The moment, yeah. you know? Yeah, man. I, yeah, I can only imagine, like, especially if it is Frank's, you know, undrafted guy coming in, you know, maybe he has to come in at the end of a game or something for Ryan, and it's like, oh, crap. Like, you know, lights on, got to go out there, command an offense, you know, Calvin Ridley, Kyle Pitts, you know, one of the best players in college football now in the NFL, Jake Matthews, all these, like, you know, star players potentially that you have to go command and you just have to get over it. You got, you can't, you can't choke up, you know, you got to just get over that real quick. So mm-hmm. get rid of the butterflies. <laughs> Stop being so starstruck and go run the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's very interesting stuff. So we're going to see, we'll see what happens there, but yeah, I mean, talking through it now with you guys, I think we still don't know anything about it. Uh, especially not before preseason, but the fact that they haven't added another quarterback probably bodes well for Franks in terms of he's at least competitive. Um, they're not feeling like, okay, we need to uh, add somebody else to add some more competition here. We need to do something else. And there may still be additions. You know, we'll see. You never know. But uh, it is interesting at this point. So, um, all right, well, we'll go ahead. I know people are probably itching to get to the Hawks game. We appreciate you guys. Chill it out with us tonight uh, in the middle of the dead zone and during literally like the best Hawks season in like five years. Still had like 60 people chilling with us tonight. So we appreciate you guys. Um, everyone that's watching the show tomorrow, we appreciate you guys for, for rewatching as well. Um, before we take off, first of all, I want to thank both uh, Dave Cho. He's at the Falcoholic on an Ekich at say which way and Evan Birchfield at Evan Birchfield for, for tuning in. Uh, when they could, I know they had other obligations tonight that they had to get to. So we thank them for, for coming on. Um, you can check all their work out at the falcoholic.com. Evan Birchfield also runs the Falcoholic Instagram. So make sure you follow us on there as well. Uh, and Adnan, I know he's, I think he's still in the midst of his, uh, greatest Falcons moments series. So you definitely want to check that out. Vote in that. Uh, if you haven't done that yet, that's a lot of fun for this dead zone of the off season. We also have with us tonight. Keenan Forney, former Falcons great. Thank you so much, Keenan, for coming on. He is at kforney65 on Twitter and F65 Performance on Instagram, right? That's right. That's right. Yes. Give me a shout. Give me a follow. Yeah. Yeah, Keenan's great, guys. Uh, we just really appreciate you coming on, giving us that veteran perspective, all of your intimate knowledge of the offensive line. It's just really valuable. We really appreciate that. Um, anything else that you're working on? Anything else you want to plug? Uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Um, no. Yeah. I didn't know if you, you know, happened to just, you know, have, you know, well, Jake I mean, Matthews in the building this week or something, you know, like you usually do. So. <laughs> no, I mean, a, a lot of those guys, you know, they're finishing up OTAs now. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, I'm getting a few of them back here. I've been getting some text messages and some calls, guys trying to set up some stuff. So, uh, yeah, July will be a busy month as I bet. Yeah. some of these linemen are getting ready to go into camp. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I guess you know, hey, the work never stops. No, no, you know, it's it like this stops. is our break, yep, you know, yep, the media. Yep. But for these guys, it's like, oh yeah, they don't have to show up until July, but they got to make sure they're ready to hit the ground running because camp, you know, it's brutal. So, oh yeah, oh yeah, they got to stay ready so they don't got to get ready. Yep. yep. Well, we appreciate I'll let your you. Boy. Yeah, I'll let your boy if you want to uh, get that work, you know. Absolutely, guys. Keenan, I, I can't think of anyone else I'd rather learn from. So knowledgeable uh, and just a nice guy also. Fun guy to be around. So uh, definitely check him out, guys. F65 Performance on Instagram, at K4065 on Twitter. Again, thank you. We also have with us, of course, birthday boy Eric Robinson, at underscore Eric underscore Robinson on Twitter. Eric, 
happy birthday once again anything else you'd like to plug anything you're working on um right now i do have a column that's out that uh focuses on the over under of matt ryan's passing yards total this year um what to expect um so give that a look and we're gonna we're really doing a we're pretty our over under series on the falcoholic is pretty much started at this point anyway yeah so um yeah so just like i say man like i always say go to the falcoholic.com one stop shop everything you need we're there yeah hit us up yeah definitely check it out guys look there's no news to write about there's no training camp yet so like we got to do something you know we're doing we got the over under series we got the greatest moments bracket we got my player profiles that i promised dave i would write for the past several weeks that haven't started yet but they're going to happen at some point i promise you know we are trying we are trying trying. so we'll have content coming out it's it's very casual right now obviously you guys know that um but yeah guys i'm kevin knight at falcoholic kevin you can find my work at the falcoholic uh, like I said, I, I have promised Dave I will start the player profile series, and, and I, I will, I promise, to you guys also. Uh, they will be coming at some point, um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, probably won't have time to get through the undrafted guys this year, but we'll look at the starters at least, uh, maybe some of the, the primary reserves as well. Um, so check that out. Follow me on Twitter. Follow the show on Twitter, at Alcoholic Live. Do like and subscribe as well if you haven't done that already. Those metrics help us uh, get discovered on YouTube by folks that aren't already watching the show. We appreciate that. And also check out the Patreon. Uh, we've got some exciting stuff coming down the pipe uh, down the pike there. So check that out. It's patreon.com slash falcoholic live. Got a lot of tiers. You can, you know, contribute whatever you, you want to. Uh, and obviously, for those of you that just want to watch, everything here is always going to be totally free. Totally uh, we're going to do our best to not, we're not going to pay wall stuff. We're not going to put up, you know, subscriber only stuff. You know, we're going to make sure that you guys get access to everything that happens here. We might do some stuff live for patrons and things like that. But, um, you know, the free content and everyone who just watches, we appreciate you guys a lot as well. Uh, so we want to make sure all that stuff is coming to you no matter what. And we want to make sure that it's optional, that if you feel like you want to support us, that you, that you can. But it's totally up to you guys uh we just appreciate everyone for hanging out with us in the middle of this dead zone uh talking falcons just hanging out uh we appreciate all of our great guests like keenan um like some of the other players that have come on all the people at the falcoholic for helping the show go it's all of you guys not just us that make this work so uh, we wouldn't be here if you guys weren't watching so thank you again uh until next time guys we'll see you next wednesday for another show uh This is the Falcoholic Live. I'm Kevin Knight with Eric Robinson and Keenan Forney. Have a great night, folks. Go Hawks, and we'll talk to you next week. See you then, guys.